Schuyler Gregory Peterson Tosic was born on December 31, 1994, in Escondido, California. His mother, Olivia Tosic, split from his biological father when she was pregnant with him. In 2015, Schuyler lived with his mother and her extended family in their family home across from Kit Carson Park in Escondido. As a teen, he tutored his peers in math and played bass in several amateur rock bands. However, when Schuyler turned 18, he started keeping to himself and broke contact with several of his high school friends. At the age of 20, Schuyler still lived in Escondido and was studying business at Palomar College. Even then, he was reluctant to mix with new people at the college. On August 28, 2015, Schuyler sent a mysterious text to his mom that said he was hanging out with two new friends named Thaddeus and Eli. Concerned, she texted him back immediately, asking where he was, but didn't hear back from him. However, Schuyler returned home two days later on August 30th, covered in dirt and claiming he had gone hiking. She found this strange, considering he was not an outdoorsy person. He said he'd gotten dehydrated and had spent the previous night at San Pasquale Academy, a boarding school for foster teens. Olivia was in her room on the computer and asked Skylar to sit and talk with her. However, when she exited the room, he was already gone. When he left, he took an Uber to the Wild Animal Park but exited the car at 3.30 p.m. before they had even arrived at the destination. This was the last time he was ever seen. The day he went missing, he texted his father and cousin saying he was going camping for a while. Around 8 p.m. that night, Olivia received a strange text that read, There are two women with us now. They have passports and they're rich. They want me to travel with them. They want to go to... The text had stopped midway, and Olivia immediately contacted the Escondido police, voicing her concerns. Before his disappearance, Schuyler's behavior had been changing. He had lost a good amount of weight, seemed detached, and was talking about questionable religious ideologies. He left behind his wallet, identification, and money, and only took his kiss blanket with him. His family believes he may have joined a cult, was kidnapped, or possibly both. In April 2018, Olivia's partner Ray passed away, and the private investigator discontinued her investigation after being diagnosed with breast cancer. Despite the turmoil, Olivia refused to give up on the search and launched a nonprofit organization called Sky Alert Foundation. She then held a charity rock concert in August 2021 at Flawless Bistro and Bar in Escondido to raise funds for the organization. Through it, she plans to launch an app to create a nationwide network of licensed drone users to help locate missing persons much quicker than law enforcement by capturing aerial footage. Sadly, as of September 2023, Schuyler has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Just one day after Schuyler went missing, another 20-year-old man with a similar appearance also went missing from the same area. However, detectives do not believe the cases are connected. Elijah Bayer Diaz was born on August 19, 1995, and lived in San Diego, California. He was described as a young man with a very big heart, the same as Schuyler. He's Native American and a member of the Burano Indian tribe. From a very young age, he suffered from numerous health issues that made him miss school and other social events, hampering his studies to such an extent that he got his GED instead. Bear and his mother, Leilani Thompson, were very close, with his fragile health requiring constant attention and care. Bear was a type 1 diabetic, weighing only 110 pounds, and required two different types of insulin. Leilani said that partly because of spending so much of his childhood between doctor visits, Bear yearned for a normal life, leading him to have a very active social circle in his new apartment. He had guests coming over and staying frequently and would open up his house to anyone, but eventually, the situation got out of control. On August 29, 2015, after he and his mother attended a funeral, she dropped him off at his home on the 700 block of Joey Avenue in El Cajon, California, around 10 p.m. At 11.19 p.m., he sent her a text telling her goodnight. 
The next day, around 4 p.m., his mother stopped by to bring him dinner. However, he was nowhere to be found, and she immediately reported him missing. At the time, Bear could not walk without crutches or drive due to the wounds on his feet from neuropathy and sometimes needed a wheelchair. Upon investigating his apartment, they found that Bear's 50-inch television was missing from his bedroom and a safe that contained several thousand dollars was empty. Also missing was his backpack that contained his diabetes medicine. His bedroom also appeared as though a struggle had occurred and was in disarray. It's of note that Bayer would not have been able to transport a large TV in his condition. Eventually, his parents hired a private detective named Trish Gray to look for him. She believes foul play is involved since he left his toothbrush, eyeglasses, and charger behind. Detectives also found that his phone was turned off on August 30th, 2015, just one day after he was last seen and was never turned back on. Also, there has been no activity on his bank account. At 1.29 a.m., on the night he went missing, his phone pinged at a casino at the Barona Reservation. 29 minutes later, it pinged again at Santa Isabel, a little village near the San Diego Mountains. This led to a search in the highlands, a rock region teeming with wild creatures such as coyotes and bobcats. However, there was no trace of him found. There is now a $50,000 award being offered, but as of September 2023, he has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Amber Sky Graham was born in Shasta County, California on December 19, 2014. Ember's father, Matthew Ryan Graham, lived in a remote area on Nusha Lane in Happy Valley, California. Meanwhile, her mother, Jamie Lee Graham, was packing to move into her father's 25-foot camper trailer, which had no running water or functioning bathrooms and was covered in rubbish. On July 1, 2015, six-month-old Ember was home with her father. That night, Matthew decided to smoke marijuana and passed out leaving Ember asleep in her playpen. When he woke up the next morning at 5 o'clock, Ember was gone. He called 911 at 5.26 a.m. and reported that a stranger had come into the trailer and kidnapped her. That same day, Matthew was arrested for violating his probation due to his drug use, but he was released a couple days later. Also, authorities began to question his version of events that night. They noticed Matthew wasn't very interested in finding his daughter, and they could find no evidence that a stranger entered the home and took her. This led to him being considered a person of interest in the case. He continued to be uncooperative, quickly lawyered up, and refused to take a voice stress test. Not helping his story was the fact that the property was gated off and he had guard dogs. Plus, the door to the trailer was broken and had to be opened with a screwdriver. This would have made it near impossible for a stranger to come in and take Ember without waking up Matthew. Surveillance video footage from a nearby convenience store, the Happy Stop Market, showed Matthew driving in his truck on the night Ember disappeared. She can be seen in the truck, but was not fastened into her car seat. After he left the store, he drove away with her in the opposite direction from his home. Matthew said he'd taken Ember on a drive to help her fall asleep since her anti-seizure medication made her restless. He said he made a U-turn to return home after leaving the store. The trip to and from the store should have taken less than 10 minutes, but the surveillance video shows Matthew didn't drive back by the store for an entire hour after leaving. On July 10th, a pacifier was found off Platino Road in the remote Ono, California. Ember was seen on surveillance at the Happy Stop Market with a pacifier in her mouth. Jamie then confirmed it was her daughter's, and DNA testing subsequently determined Ember's DNA was on the pacifier. On July 11th, Matthew stole his mother's cell phone, some cash from her purse, and a semi-automatic handgun, and fled. Three days later, he was killed in a police shootout in Dunsmuir, California, after he carjacked a vehicle. A few days after that, authorities located a backpack belonging to Matthew in a wooded area about 250 yards from his home on Cottage Avenue. Police found various items inside the backpack, but nothing pertaining to the case. 
Investigators are hoping that Matthew might have shared information about that night with someone because without it, this case may likely never be solved. If Ember were still alive, she would be almost nine years old, but as of September 2023, she has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Hey y'all, today's video is sponsored by an amazing new company called Rose Forever. Rose Forever was founded in 2019 in New York and set out to deliver the best quality roses straight from Ecuador. Ecuador's high altitude, closeness to the equator, and nutrient-rich soil help to grow the world's most beautiful roses. Rose Forever provides 100% natural fresh roses in these wonderful, luxurious rose boxes. Also, the roses can last for over a year with the help of natural oils, not chemicals, that they use to preserve the flowers. Oh, and did I mention that professional rose artisans handcraft all their bouquets? How awesome is that? While my roses came in a round box, you can also get square or even heart-shaped boxes with anywhere from 9 to 49 roses in them. Plus, you can get these allergen-free roses in up to 15 different colors. I almost forgot the best part. If you use my code SGCS25, you will get a $25 discount. Oh, and don't worry, my overseas friends, because guess what? Rose Forever ships worldwide. I know y'all have some loved ones out there who could sure use a nice bouquet of roses. So stop what you're doing and go click the link in the description and use my code SGCS25 to get your $25 discount today. Carrie Louise Patterson was born on September 11, 1964, in California. Carrie's biological father was not in the picture, and so her stepfather basically raised her from a very young age. At the age of 15, her family moved from Cerritos, California, to Fullerton after some female bullies physically attacked her. Her sister Michelle said that Carrie was very pretty and had a lot of boyfriends and was being hassled by a lot of girls, and at one point, someone ripped off her gold necklace. Carrie was described as outgoing, athletic, and popular, which is why a lot of the girls didn't like her. After going through all that, she was looking forward to a new start at a new high school once summer was over. Sadly, she would never get the chance. On June 26, 1980, just two weeks after moving, Carrie asked her mother about taking the bus to Huntington Beach with her 12-year-old sister Michelle, but was told no. Their mother, Crystal, instead asked her to stay home and wait for the moving company to drop off the furniture since she had to go to work. Carrie then watched some soap operas with her sister before she decided to ignore her mother's request and left the house around 1 p.m. to walk to a nearby ice cream parlor. She agreed to meet her friend Danny, Daniel Wazab, from Cerritos at the Ice Cream Castle at the Sunny Hill Shopping Center in Fullerton, which was only about a mile from her home. She left her younger sister at home to deal with the furniture, telling her she'd bring her back a candy bar. She and Danny met up with two other mutual friends, Michael Cruz and Troy LeClear. After meeting up, she told her friends she was going to head back home and wash her shoes, a white pair of Vans, because they had gotten dirty and she liked to keep them clean. She said afterward she might go to a local horse stable. She then had Danny ride her home on his bicycle. Danny, along with the other two boys, dropped her off about 4 p.m. at the corner of Parks and Pioneer, not far from her house. After this sighting, she was never seen alive again. It's of note that the neighborhood they moved to was brand new and there was often construction workers in the area working. When Carrie didn't arrive home by 7.30 p.m., her family notified the police. However, like a lot of cases during that decade, they believed she was just another runaway teenager. However, Carrie's mother knew better and tried to convince the Fullerton police otherwise. Rumors also began to spread that Carrie had borrowed money and was hanging out somewhere in her new town. However, her family knew that wasn't true, and in fact, Carrie had been excited about a weekend trip to the mountains she'd planned with a friend for the next day, which she was already packed for. She even left money on her dresser and only took a small purse with her that day. If she had run away, why wouldn't she have taken all the money she had with her? 
It was reported that police officers never came to the Patterson home to talk with her parents, and her room wasn't investigated until a week later. The house and neighborhood were also not searched for clues by law enforcement. None of the construction workers in the area were questioned, nor were any of the girls with whom she had prior disagreements. The missing persons report wasn't accepted until a day after Carrie had vanished. However, the police have denied this, stating there were interviews with the boys Carrie had met, including Danny and Carrie's family. After increasing criticism from the family for their inactivity, her mother, Crystal, called the mayor. At that point, she was invited to join the police in a cruiser the next day as they searched for Carrie. However, they ended up in a bowling alley coffee shop where they sat for three hours after police claimed they received a tip that she had been there. According to a detective on the case, the boys she was with have never changed their story. However, if she was indeed going home, it's strange that she would have disappeared on Peacock Lane, where she lived, considering how many workers and other people were out and about. Later that year, on December 27, 1980, a worker in the Union Oil Field in Tonner Canyon in Bria, California, came across a human skull in the middle of the oil field near Freeway 57. This area is about 12 miles from where she was last seen. Upon further searching, a few more bones were also discovered in the area. After learning of the discovery, Carrie's mom, Crystal, waited about three weeks before contacting the coroner out of fear of what she would be told. Carrie's dental records were then compared against the skull found, and it confirmed the remains belonged to her. Unfortunately, her cause of death could not be determined due to the condition of the remains. Of course, this area is also known as Lover's Lane, leading some to believe she might have actually been meeting up with a boy. Another issue with this case is that detectives received numerous false reports during the initial investigation, with several people claiming they saw Carrie or even talked to her after she went missing, but those all proved untrue. Her sister, Michelle, believes she knows who might be responsible, but that person died years ago. Carrie's remains weren't the first found in the area then. On April 16, 1979, 14-year-old Vicki Lynn Casquick was abducted on her way to Cerritos High, the same school that Carrie had attended. Thirteen months later, in May of 1980, her skeletonized remains were found by a hiker south of the Pomano Freeway in Roland Heights, California. The same month, on May 1, 1980, the remains of an unidentified man were found in the creek bed of a heavily wooded area at a shell oil field. It was not far from Tonner Canyon Road. The man was black between the ages of 17 and 23. The case took an unusual turn during Halloween of 1981 when David Richard Campbell shot and dismembered his friend William Kimball Raber of Buena Park. Campbell had convinced himself that Raber had been responsible for killing several women in Orange County, including Carrie Patterson. However, there is no evidence to support Campbell's claims. He was ultimately convicted for the murder of three men in the Fullerton area. His motives remain unknown, besides his claims that he's a vigilante. There's another potential suspect by the name of Raymond J. Bartlett. When Bartlett was 34 years old, he was arrested for the sexual assault and murder of 14-year-old Wendy Osborne, who was abducted while walking to school. He was eventually caught after DNA linked him to her murder. Raymond lived in Fullerton in the 80s, but has since passed away. As of September 2023, Carrie's killer has never been found, and her case remains unsolved. Leslie Charles Crane was born on February 4, 1966, in Norwich, Connecticut, and went by Les. Les came to California in 2002 with $100 and his dog. He then survived the first few months from the generosity of the local Mendocino County food banks. At the age of 39, he lived on County Road 307 in Laytonville, California. Les's sister said that he had a typical New England assholishness and wasn't shy about expressing his opinions. Even with that, his community loved him as a dedicated medical marijuana activist, dispensary owner, and local philanthropist. He loved to help others and even used his own money to open a youth center in Laytonville complete with pool tables, games, and snacks. 
In May 2002, deputies raided Les's property, seizing 5,000 marijuana plants and $6,000 in gold. He told reporters that deputies raided him after he called police about an attempt to rob his house. Les said they took all his information about the attempted robbery and returned with a search warrant. Unfortunately, in Mendocino County, sheriff deputies were seizing money from the marijuana growers and not filing reports on it. They were doing this most likely so they could just keep the money for themselves. On August 13, 2004, Les had attorney Robert Boyd file a complaint to get the $3,740 back that the Mendocino County sheriffs took from him. On May 13, Les won the asset forfeiture claim to have the sheriff return his $3,740 plus whatever else they had seized. Three days later, on May 16, Les was raided again by the Mendocino County Sheriff and the County of Macomb Enforcement Team. They took 30 South African Gold Krugerrands and 5,000 marijuana plants, totaling around $60,000. Even though the police had seized his property for a second time, he still had not been arrested or charged with any crime. Four days after that, attorney Bob Boyd filed a civil lawsuit on behalf of Les, seeking to have his property returned from the previous day's raid. During the week of June 13th, Les took out a personal ad in the Ukiah Daily Journal that read, Attention all Prop 215 patients, if you had your garden raided, please call Les Crane at Mendo Spiritual Remedies. That same year, a court ruling gave the feds the right to raid dispensaries. So Les decided to claim he was a church instead and would sue the feds if he was raided. He leased a property in Ukiah on State Street, hoping to open a dispensary. However, the city of Ukiah passed an urgent ordinance preventing new dispensaries from opening. The city officials then issued Les a letter threatening action if they opened their Crane and Hemp Plus ministry. However, he ignored the threats, opened the dispensary on September 28th, and took out a full-page ad in the Ukiah Daily Journal. The manager of the store, Patrick Duff, then produced and published a video of the dispensary's first day. You are, you are an American, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. I just making sure we were we had to step out of our country. It does appear not yet. Just a little. Yeah. On October 19, 2005, Les was arrested and charged with two felonies for cultivation and possession stemming from the raid on his home in May. A week later, Les paid more than a dozen people from around the country to come and stay in Laytonville to attend the first-ever United Cannabis Ministers Conference, which was held at Area 101. Les even donated six pounds of cannabis for the event. In November, he was formally arraigned at the Ukiah Courthouse. On the morning of November 16, 2005, Les spent $7,000 on 350 turkeys and delivered them to the food banks in Mendocino County so everyone could have a turkey the next week on Thanksgiving. Before his scheduled court appearance, where he planned to reject their plea deal and plead not guilty, he handed out a bag full of free cannabis to supporters and passersby. This aggravated other marijuana growers who were hoping that Les would quit stirring up trouble. A week later, he would be dead. On the night of November 17th, Les's employee, Sean Durlam, was staying at the house and wanted to score some Oxycontin. Les's girlfriend, Jennifer, said she knew how he could get some cheap and set up the deal. However, Les wasn't happy about this, and he and Jennifer got into an argument. Sean, not wanting to upset Les further, snuck out of the home and met the friend by the gate. Afterward, he returned to the house, went to his room, took the pills, and went back to sleep. Around 2.30 in the morning, at least four men armed with guns and a baseball bat stormed into Les's house, screaming, this is a raid. The men then began to beat Sean as he slept, breaking his arm, scarring his head, and dragging him into the main part of the house where the kitchen and dining room were. Meanwhile, Jennifer, who was sleeping in a separate bedroom after the argument, opened her door and was immediately attacked. One of the men ordered them to shoot her, but thankfully they missed. Les was then shot to death in his bedroom. After that, the intruders fled the scene. Sean then called 911 and began trying to help Les, who was now bleeding to death. In Les's final moments, Jennifer asked who did this, to which he replied, they came to see the Count today, which was Sean's nickname. 
Several of Les's friends told reporters they were convinced at least one of the invaders was familiar with the residence's layout, and sheriff deputies at the time agreed. On December 14th, even with Les now dead, DA Norm Broman still refused to drop the charges against him. Strangely, three days later, Sheriff Tony Craver suddenly resigned, citing his bad back as the reason. Not even a year later, Norm Broman died of a heart attack. Interestingly, Broman had served nine months in a federal prison in 1992 for tax evasion, and around the time he died, the FBI was in the process of raiding his home for possessing unauthorized weapons. Les's sister, Laura Smith, believes her brother had over a million dollars the night he was killed and believes that was most likely the motive. However, Sean, who typically handled the money, said there was only around $7,000 in the home that night. There's a lot of unknown in this case, but the motive clearly appears to be money. Unfortunately, as of September 2023, Les's murder remains unsolved. 